Everybody, hello, welcome back. This, today is the second day of our C3 AI workshop. We are very delighted to have another great set of speakers um, talking about mostly networks for MF. And my name is Mania Gavadi, together with my co-host uh, Miriam Merdard, we are happy to welcome our speakers and you all. Muriel, back to you. Thank you very much, Manya. Uh, and yes, thank you to everybody for, for joining. We had really a fantastic, very lively session yesterday. We're looking forward to another one today. And I am delighted to be uh, um, welcoming today uh, a dear friend and a colleague I admire deeply, Yonina Aldar. Uh, Yonina is, uh, again, uh, one of these people who spans intellectually uh, from signal processing to networking uh, and does so in an original and you know such insightful vivacious way you know when I think of you you know, I always think of vivacious you know quick uh, quick witted and just uh, sees through things and, and is able to uh, to, to really um, elicit connections. Uh, and really work to, to make those connections into new discoveries um, for engineering. So with that, uh, again, as I've uh, mentioned yesterday, in case some people weren't here, I'm not giving standard intros. Everybody can go online, look at our um, at the see at the bios of our speakers and go, wow. Uh, so you don't need me to do that. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm giving the, the, the informal, non-standard <laughs> intro. And with that, Yonina, on to you. <laughs> Maria, thank you so much for that. Uh, the, the best introduction I ever got. Um, I don't I don't know that it's all true, but, you know, it was uh, thank you very much for being so kind. Uh, so thanks a lot, Muriel, for the very kind introduction and the admiration is totally mutual. Uh, so it's it's really a great honor to, to have received this invitation from Mania and Muriel, you know, two, two of my colleagues who I uh, really admire and, and enjoy very much working with them and, and seeing their work. So it's, it's great to be here. So what I want to talk about today, and I'll try to squeeze it into uh, 20 minutes, is how we can merge ideas of, you know, signal processing and model-based uh, processing to Together with deep networks, uh, you know, of course, today, deep networks are everywhere, but could we get kind of, you know, the flavor of signal processing and models combined with deep networks? And that's really what I'm going to uh, try to be focusing on a little bit today. And depending on time, we'll go into applications to both uh, imaging and communication systems. So everyone here on this uh, Zoom Zoom workshop knows that, you know, deep learning is everywhere. It revolutionized, of course, many, many fields. And really, it's been most successful in areas where there's a lot of training data available and we didn't really have very good models before that so you know computer vision and speech processing are really two uh, very good examples so we know that today we could use deep networks or, or GANs or you know different variations thereof uh, to do many interesting things so we could spawn fake faces we could you know surpass human ability in in detection and you know many many other uh, very inspiring applications so there's a lot of success but there's, of course, also a lot of difficulties. So first of all, we need huge training sets in order to succeed. It's not always clear you know, what we're getting and why we're getting it. So sometimes there's the feeling that if we didn't get the result we liked, we could just stir you know, a little bit more and then maybe the results will be what we want them to be. So you know, that's not necessarily very satisfying. The training time could be very, very large. Um, and we know that there's many other issues such as generalization, robustness, even small changes in parameters like channel SNR if we're thinking about communication, could highly affect the system. And of course, the complexity could be very large. So if we look, for example, at you know, GPT-3, which has amazing performance in you know, uh, human, human text generation, it's using 175 billion parameters. So, so those are numbers that at least coming from you know, signal processing or communication, it, it's very hard to imagine using so many numbers of parameters in order to get a system. Now, on the other hand, if we look at signal processing or communications, which are kind of by definition model based, they work in a very different way. So some of the advantages that they're, of course, based on models, which means that we can incorporate what we know about the problem, whether it's structure or domain knowledge. We could perform inference from small amounts of data. We have very nice techniques to assess the quality of the output. So not only do we get a solution, but we can also say something about um, its quality, which is of course hard to do with deep networks. But on the other hand, it relies on the fact that we know the model, which 
Of course, in deep networks, we don't have to know. And inference can often be very slow or very complicated. So what we wanna look at is whether we could combine kind of the best of both of these worlds. So how could we do that? Well, I'll try to give kind of, you know, just a cartoon view of how we may be able to do that. And then we'll go into more of the mathematical details. So if we think about signal processing at a very, very high level, we could think of it as a system which obtains a single input. So we have some input Y, we have some desired output X. So Y could be, for example, you know, a noisy input on the channel. X could be the bits that we want to recover. And then we have some known a priori relationship between our input y and some function of the desired output. So this is assumed known in advance. And then we choose our favorite metric. It could be, for example, a norm, although it doesn't have to be a norm, um, to optimize. Let's say we minimize the distance between y and this known function g of x. So typically, this won't have a closed form solution. We'll get some sort of iterative algorithm, which will look something like this. So we'll have some pre-processing. We'll then have some iterative step, which typically will iterate between some generic computation and something that depends on the model, which we may not know. And then we have some post processing that will give us an output. Okay, so if we think very schematically about signal processing or communication algorithms, they'll look something like this. Now, on the other hand, deep networks, of course, look very, very different. So what we do is we have paired inputs and outputs. Okay, of course, not a single one, but many, many inputs and outputs. We typically have a fixed architecture that's fixed in advance. It's not necessarily related to the specific problem we're interested in. And then we use those inputs and outputs to learn the weights in this fixed architecture. And then when our new input Y comes in, we hope that we'll get a good output X after we've trained the network. Okay, so of course, you know, this is this is just a cartoon version of two of these approaches, but it gives us a flavor of what these two methods do and particularly how they differ. So how could we merge them? Well, we're going to look at two approaches to merging them um, in the short talk today. So one is based on unfolding or enrolling, where basically we integrate model-based algorithms into deep networks. And the other is a little bit the other way around, uh, what we call data-driven hybrid algorithms, where basically we integrate deep networks into model-based algorithms. So I'll try to explain uh, both of these approaches in the next few slides. So the first idea based on unfolding or enrolling goes back to a really beautiful paper of Gregor and Lacoon from you know, more than 10 years ago, um, which really spawned this field. Although for many years, kind of, uh, there haven't been many follow-ups, but in, in the past few years, a lot of people, particularly in the signal processing community, are looking at these approaches. So so the idea unfolding is heavily based on these optimization ideas, where we go back to you know, our favorite iterative algorithm for solving the objective that we want to solve. And then what we do is we explicitly write out several iterations, typically a small number, so maybe 10 iterations. So what we did here is we just applied 10 iterations of our iterative algorithm. Okay, so there's no learning yet. But then to incorporate learning, what we do is that in the final stage, we free some of the parameters in this iterative algorithm. So we'll see some examples later on, but basically what it means is these iterative steps depend on our model, which we may not know. So those parameters we learn from training data. So what we end up with is a method whose architecture depends on the optimization problem we started off with. So it's not fixed in advance, but the parameters are learned. So we don't necessarily have to assume that we know everything in advance. And this is what we refer to as algorithm unrolling or algorithm unfolding. And those of you interested, we have a recent review that we wrote about this method. So just to show you very briefly how it works on a simple problem, basically going back to the problem that Gregor and Lacoon looked like looked at. So they looked at the basic sparse recovery problem where I'm trying to recover a sparse vector X from linear measurements. And the standard way to do that is to write down a least squares objective with an L1 sparsity prior. And then if you just do a gradient or a proximal gradient for this problem, you'll end up getting a method that iterates between a consistency term. This basically applies the gradient to this squared error term and the soft thresholding, which is the proximal projection for this L1 term. Okay, so this is what you'd get for doing a proximal gradient on this original problem. Of course, this method requires you to know A, the transfer matrix, and you have to somehow choose these regularization parameters. So what you would do in order to get an unfolded method is that you take this basic iterative step, you write it down several times, k times, and then you free these blocks. So here these blocks depend on known parameters on the system, and here you would learn them from training data. So this is kind of how you could get a network from a given optimization problem. And the nice thing is that, of course, it's interpretable because you could 
refer back to the optimization problem that you started with. It will depend on the specific optimization method. So it's not generic, it will be per problem. Um, it, it will be low complexity because typically these methods are not uh, very deep. And it's, it's relatively easy to, to train them. There's not a lot of parameters and they tend to work very efficiently. So this is kind of the basic idea and we'll see some extensions uh, later on in the talk. So that's the basic idea of unfolding. The second approach we use is actually very, very simple. In fact, it's embarrassingly simple. So it happens to work well, particularly in communication problems. But the idea behind it is, is really, really simple. So here, instead of starting with the original optimization problem, what we do is kind of the reverse. We start with the algorithm. And that's because those methods in optimization, like the Viterbi algorithm, which is hard to link back to the original optimization problem. It's basically dynamic programming, but it's very well-known method that works very well. So in those cases, what we do is we actually look at the method itself and any block that depends on something we don't know, we just replace by a local network. So instead of doing end-to-end -end learning and training and having an end-to-end -end network, we use a network only in the particular block that we need it. Okay, so this is really, really simple, but we'll see later on um, that it actually works very well and leads to some interesting new network architectures. So these are the basic two ideas. And now I'm going to take the time I have left to see how this works in different applications. And this will allow us also to go a little bit more into the algorithmic aspects. So let's start with a very, very generic um, image blurring application. This is maybe, you know, one of the most standard applications in image processing. And of course, there's been, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of works on, on how to do this. And lately, people are using, of course, a lot of deep network ideas in order to deblur or denoise images. And what we wanted to do is to say, let's just go back to, you know, basic principles. So what would it look like from an optimization perspective? Unfold that. And to, to be fair, when we started this, we didn't think we'd get a method that's actually better than state-of-the-art. We only hope to kind of get close to state-of-the-art with something very simple. And as you'll see, it actually works better than uh, state-of-the-art deep networks that are much more complicated. So what we do is very simple. We set up a least squares sparse recovery problem. But what we do is instead of setting it up you know, let's say in the image domain, we set it up in a feature domain. So these Fs are features, which we're going to learn. Okay, so in the optimization problem, we assume they're fixed, but later on, we learn them from data. So this is just a basic deep learning problem where we're trying to learn both the underlying image or the uh, features of the image. We impose a sparsity prior, which is very typical in image processing, and we impose a norm constraint on the unknown blur. Again, just to make sure that it's bounded. And then we use a basic ADMM or variable splitting approach in order to solve this optimization problem. So up until this point, we're just setting this up as an optimization problem. But then in the final step, in the learning step, we're going to learn these features and not assume that they're known in advance. So we end up getting a very simple network like you see over here. It's doing basic image processing steps, but it's learning the features as it's going through these iterations rather than assuming that they're known in advance. So the nice thing is that when we compare this to you know, state-of-the-art networks that are out there today, we actually get, get better performance, as you could see here on the slide, and we do that from much less training data. So from less training data, we could get better performance. And in a sense, it's not surprising because we're incorporating knowledge into the problem. Um, now, the next step that, that we looked at, which is useful in problems that are more complicated than to blurring, like in painting when we're missing patches in the picture, is that instead of assuming that we know the regularizer, so in the previous approach, we assumed an L1 regularizer, we're actually going to learn the regularizer together with learning the features. So the way we learn the regularizer is by using the very popular uh, normalizing flow priors. And this is a method that's used a lot in learning, but typically people learn in advance. So they use the database to learn a flow prior, and then they use that within the network. What we do instead is that we parameterize this flow prior, and we learn the parameters as we go through the iteration. So basically, we're unfolding the prior as well. And it turns out that this gives our network even more power, so we could do much more complicated things like in painting, for example, together with the blurring and denoising. So even if there's parts of the image that we in entirely, we never see them in advance, um, we can fill them in much better than competing methods, which again, are much more complicated, have hundreds of layers and train on much larger data sets. So this kind of shows the power of using this principled model-based optimization approach, but we're not assuming we know anything in advance, we're learning everything, but learning it within a very principled framework. 
So we've used this for many other applications as well. I'll go through, through this quickly because I know there's a lot, not a lot of time. So one, one um, method that we use this for is separation. So separating, here we're looking at ultrasound images where we're trying to separate tissue, which is a fixed background clutter from the blood, which is flowing. And we do that by using a low rank plus sparse model. So we're modeling the tissue as having low rank and the blood flow as being sparse. But again, we're gonna unfold this into a deep network. So it's a very similar idea. We set up an optimization problem with an L1 prior on the blood and a low rank prior on the um, tissue background. But then instead of just solving it using a gradient approach, we unfold it and learn the parameters as we go through this network. And again, I'll skip the optimization details, but this does a really good job in separating the tissue and the blood. And the training is done from only 20 images. Okay, so we could get very good results, even though we're doing this on a very small data set. And of course, we could compare this to deep networks that are just doing direct um, deep learning. And even though we give them much more training data, um, the results using the model-based approach tend to be much better. Um, so we could use this for other, other problems in ultrasound. I won't go into detail here. We've been looking a lot at medical imaging. And in medical imaging, these approaches are very useful because there's a lot that you typically know about the problem that you can incorporate into these models. So finally, I'll just mention that we've been uh, working on this a lot with several hospitals in Israel in the context of COVID-19. So we've been using these methods for um, detection of COVID, both from ultrasound and from X-ray. And by using these model-based approaches, we could get uh, very high detection rates from small Small data sets, which is important because we don't really have a lot of data from training. There's a lot of variation uh, between data from different hospitals, and, and also there's a lot of privacy issues. So in this context, this is very useful. All right, so that's one approach that we could use it for, for you know different denoising detection type problems. We could also use this for super resolution, which is something uh, else we've been looking at in recent years, both in microscopy and in ultrasound. So let me just very, very briefly, I know we don't have a lot of time, but I'll just give kind of a brief introduction to this notion of super resolution in microscopy and ultrasound. So when we use an optical microscope, we're limited by physics, unfortunately. <laughs> so we're always limited to half the wavelength we're using for illumination, which means that we can see you know big things like cells and bacteria but we can't see proteins and small molecules now a very clever idea that actually won the nobel prize um, in 2014 was to use this notion of fluorescence microscopy where we insert fluorophores into whatever it is that we're trying to into the object that we're trying to image and instead of taking a single image we take thousands of exposures where in each exposure, only a small number of fluorophores are fluorescing. So because in each exposure, there's only like three green dots, you could localize them. So stick a Gaussian every time you see something blinking. And then if you sum over all of these thousands of exposures, you'll get a super resolved image. So this works very well. It, it That's why I got the Nobel Prize. So you can increase resolution down to 20 nanometers, which is very good resolution, but it does this at the expense of time. Okay, because now to get a single image, you need thousands of exposures, and therefore you can no longer use this for live cell imaging, which is very important if you want to understand different biological phenomena. So I'll, I'll skip the technical details here, but what we did is we um, applied this notion of sparse recovery onto these images, because at the end, these images are very sparse and they're blinking in a very sparse way. And first we did it without unfolding. So just applying the optimization approach. And even just from the optimization approach, you already get a very big gain over the method behind the Nobel Prize. So this method storm is the method behind the Nobel Prize here. We're using, it's using 12,000 frames and you get good resolution, but it requires 12,000 frames. Whereas using our sparsity-based approach, we could get uh, even better resolution using two orders of magnitude less exposures. Here you see a cavity that you can see, for example, in the storm image. So that was very nice and very encouraging. The difficulty, though, is that to get these good results, we actually had to do a lot of measurements on the system itself. So we had to know the system PSF and other features of the system, which are quite difficult to do in practice. So the next step was to unfold this idea. And the nice thing about the unfolded version is that, first of all, we get much better resolution, as you see over here. And furthermore, we don't assume anything about the system. And all of the learning was done from a single image. So basically, you could come to a new microscope that you've never seen before and from a single output get this very high resolution and we could do it very very quickly so it gives us both super resolution in time and super resolution in space 
So uh, we're now working together with Professor Gilad Daran from the Weizmann Institute to actually apply this to, uh, to analyze the behavior of T-cell receptors, which are very important in the immune system. And we're getting some really exciting results of being able to see the cells evolving in very high resolution in real time. The, the final thing I want to point out is using this in ultrasound. So, um, you know, it's nice we can use it for microscopes. Our next thought was, okay, so could we increase, for example, resolution of ultrasound? And of course, the difficulty here is that we can't really inject fluorophores or we don't want to inject fluorophores um, into our bloodstream. But instead, we can inject what are known as uh, micro bubbles. So this is FDA approved. This is used for contrast. So it's used for other reasons. But basically, this is gas that you can inject into the blood flow. And then mathematically, we're actually getting the same thing as we got in the microscopy example. So here you see a clinical uh, test trial that we did uh, with our collaborators, Dr. Hoover Grubstein at Bailington Hospital. And the clinical test here was looking at um, patients with breast cancer, where today ultrasound can't really be used to diagnose uh, whether the, the cancer is malignant or not. And by injecting these micro bubbles, you'll see next, we could get really good resolution and be able to do this diagnosis, again, with using this unfolded super resolution. And there's no a priori training here. It's all done from the actual image Images that we received. So let me just show this quickly. Here you see two patients. Um, if you look at the top image, in both of them, you clearly see a lesion, but you can't see the details of the lesion. And this is why these patients are sent for biopsies. But if you look at the recovery we, we, we get after our method, you see that these two lesions are very, very different. The vasculature is very different. And clinically, this indicates that this tumor is actually benign and this tumor is malignant. And you could tell that from the specific vasculature that you could see here in high resolution. So um, I, we're, we're slightly running out of time. So let me just mention that we can also use these ideas to robustify networks by starting from robust optimization and then getting robust unfolding. So I'll skip the details here, but we could use this to robustify networks and tolerate networks with a lot of error as well. Uh, the final point I wanna make in the context of communication is that we can use these methods very nicely in communication systems, where here we use the second approach of starting from the method itself, not from the optimization formulation. And that's because in communication, there's many examples of, of working methods that work very well. They depend on knowing the channel, which is the difficulty. But on the other hand, they're very, very efficient. So rather than trying to come up with new optimization formulations, we looked at these problems. We started with the optimization methods and just substituted small networks in areas where the channel wasn't known. So let me just quickly show what this ends up looking like. So starting from the Viterbi algorithm, which is probably you know, one of the most famous um, algorithms in communication, for detecting um, you know, bits sent over a known channel. So it is assumed that you know the channel here. And if you actually dissect the Viterbi algorithm and write it up properly, you'll see that most of it does not depend on channel knowledge. The only thing that depends on the channel knowledge is computation of the likelihood. And therefore, instead of replacing the entire end-to-end -end system by a deep network, like many people are doing, all we have to do is compute the likelihood with actually a very shallow network because it's an easy computation to do and then use the dynamic programming as we would before. So this is what we call the Viterbi net. This was joint work with the group of Andrea Goldsmith. And not surprisingly, it works very well. It adapts very well to channel variations and it's very quick and efficient. So we could do this to other methods, factor graph methods, um, soft interference cancellation. So in all of these applications of communications, there's known methods. We start from those own, own, known methods and only replace the likelihood computation um, with a shallow network and keep the rest of the method um, as is. And in this way, we could come up with methods that could adapt to unknown channels, but without having to do end-to-end -end learning. So I see I'm out of time, so let me wrap up. Uh, what we try to show is how we can merge existing signal processing and communication algorithms with machine learning tools. It appears to give very good performance from tra small training sets. Of course, the interesting question is, you know, could we characterize this analytically? We have some beginning of anal analytical results. Hopefully, I'll be able to share that um, in the next workshop. And those of you interested, we have a recent review on model-based learning that we wrote on this topic. So thank you very much. Uh, for your attention. Thank you to my team. Of course, all of this was done with my team of students and amazing team of collaborators. So thank you very much for your attention and happy to take questions.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Nina, for that, you know, um, highly dynamic and just full of ideas. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, I can't. It is. It's it's just, I think it's, 20 minutes for me is a challenge. So <laughs> it's just, no, it's great. It's uh, it's it's like it's it's just so much, uh, uh, you know, so much innovation and such an exciting time and things are happening really in real time. Um, <laughs> I see a question here. Um, is it possible to explain more on the mechanism of regularizer learning? So um, just, just to clarify the question, is that about general unfolding or the robust version? I'm just not sure. Or I could say there something isn't, about uh, There isn't uh, an... A okay, let me just... I'll say I, would, I would imagine maybe a bit of... Oh, learning, yes, yes, yeah, sorry. Okay, now I know. I guess the flow, yeah. The flow learning. So in, in standard unfolding, we start with an objective and a regularizer. And we could learn parameters of the regularizer, like if there's a matrix in there, if there's a regularization parameter, but we do assume the basic structure. So let's say we could have an L1 regularizer in some basis. We could learn the basis, but we're still assuming L1. An alternative, if we really don't know what to assume, like if we have no reason to assume sparsity, for example, is that we could try to use a parameterized PDF. So you could think of it as like map estimation, but instead of, you know, learning a PDF would be hard. So we could look at PDFs that are parameterized and invertible flows are a family of PDFs that are parameterized. So we could kind of stick them there instead of the regularizer. But instead mm -hmm. of what people do today is that they learn the PDF in advance. So they'll have some, you know, large training set that has nothing to do with the particular problem, use that to learn a PDF and then plug it into their problem. What we do instead is we say, let's put, let's put that PDF in there as a regularizer and learn the parameters as part of the unfolding. So just like we would learn, you know, the lambda or the regularization parameter, we'll learn all of the parameters of the PDF as part of the unfolding. And the advantage is that it's not fixed in advance. So as we're going through the iterations, we're basically getting a better approximation of the underlying PDF. So I hope that addresses the question. If whoever asked if that, if you want more detail, we actually have a paper on that in our card. So you could just send me an email and I could refer you to the paper. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have a quick question before we take more. Um, so when you look at these different applications, you know, whether it be say um, an ultrasound or, you know, so, so some other, so some other images or d different signals in general. So th there's so much work on, you know, different types of, uh, and, and you know, there's so much better than I do uh, on, on different types of, um, uh, uh, you know, measures of uh, basically distortion, mm -hmm. uh, you know, what is the most relevant distortion? Um, is there an interesting aspect here with exploring to what extent different distortions might actually cause different uh, choices? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Really, really good question. We're actually starting to look at that. So I'd love to talk about it with you offline as well. So excellent question. And it actually ties a this little bit. Everybody, this was not prepped. We did oh, not prep. Not prepped. Prepped. <laughs> we promise, right? Um, but, but excellent, excellent question. And it ties a little bit to the invertible flows I was talking about before, because it, it's different in the sense that the distortion is more on the overall learning. So I have like an overall learning criteria. And then within that overall learning criteria, I have the unfolding criteria. So some of what we've been thinking about is, you know, could we merge them and unfold everything, including the loss function? So kind of merging everything together. And we, we, I'd love to talk about this. We've been thinking a little bit about it. It's a really good question, because if I could think of, you know, we, we don't do things blind, right? So I would think of having, let's say, a family of distortions, right? Or, or even just starting with norms and saying, okay, you know, I want to learn what is the best norm, right? Like just to make it easy. Yeah. So you could start with like families of norms and saying, you know, could I, could I learn the norm parameter as part of learning the unfolding? So it's a super interesting um, question. Of course, a little bit tricky with which parts are supervised and which parts are unsupervised, but it's, I, I'd love to talk about this offline. It's, we, we've begun thinking about it and it'd be great to chat. I think it's a really exciting thing to look at because it could, it could have effect on a lot of different types of problems. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but it's, it's definitely when you were showing those pictures, it just it popped, you know. Yeah, that, yeah. Uh, no, it's a really, it's a really important, that's kind of like, you know, we're viewing it as kind of a next step of merging, because right now there's a loss and there's the unfolding thing, and we're learning the unfolding thing, but not yet learning the loss. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're trying to look at, could we merge them and then just learn everything? 
Fantastic. That's a great, great point. And definitely on my list to chat about next week. <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. I am clapping. Everybody's clapping. I'll, I'll use my, my uh, reactions here. There you go. Uh, <laughs> Thanks. And if there's any other questions, I'm happy. Feel free to send me an email thank and I'll, you. I'll be happy I'm going to gonna pop your email in the chat because there's a request. Oh, I could do that. Oh, okay. Could I do that? Actually, I'm not sure. I'll try. And it's yeah. on to Nanya. So thank you. Thank you again, Yanina.